The Mexico race is an outlier on the Formula 1 calendar due to its altitude. The effects from being so high above sea level saw a slight shifting of the power structure in F1, with Red Bull and Renault in particular able to show particular strength. So what effects come out of racing at high altitude? Well, as someone on a mountain once said, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Okay, so the thick and thin of the matter is that all of the curiosities of racing at higher altitudes come from the change in air density. You can think about all of the air around the world as a giant sea of air molecules to some extent. But unlike liquid, air is very compressible. If you squish it up, all the molecules will move closer together. So you can see the air right at the bottom of the atmosphere, the air right down at sea level, has all of the mass of the air above pushing down on it. And this compresses the air, increasing its pressure and increasing its density. This just means that in the same amount of space, higher density air has more molecules in it than lower density air. So if you grabbed a cubic metre of air at Monza, which is only 162 metres above the sea level, that air would weigh a robust 1.22 kilograms. But if you went to the Mexico circuit and grabbed that same cubic metre of air, it would only weigh 0.98 kilograms. The air at Monza has 26% more stuff in it than the air at Mexico. This leads us on to the interesting and often mentioned fact that, despite the fact that Mexico runs very, very aggressively high aero setup, and Monza runs very low, skinny-winged aero setup, it's the Monza package that produces more overall downforce. So let's start by looking at aerodynamics then. We've gone into much detail before about how downforce is generated, but put simply, the more air that car can heave upwards, the more that air will push the car back down. An equal and opposite reaction. The car pushes the air up, the air pushes the car down. That's why downforce increases as the car's speed increases. It passes through more air every second, so it pushes more air up every second, and so the air pushes down harder on the car every second. Now at higher altitudes, there's a lot less air in the atmosphere. In Mexico, as we learn, there's about 26% fewer air molecules available to push against, so there's less air available to push back. So you can jack the wings right up, but you're just not going to capture the same downforce levels as you can down below where the air is thick and heavy with molecules. And incidentally, that's why helicopters can't fly very well more than three kilometers above sea level. There's just not enough air for the helicopter blades to push against. Aeroplanes, on the other hand, they too have a limit where the air is too thin to lift the plane, but they run into trouble quite a bit before that ceiling. An aeroplane's altitude limit is where there simply isn't enough oxygen in the air to power the engines. And this is the other major effect on the cars at altitude. The combustion engine will be gasping for air. Okay, so let's revise how petrol engines work. This is a little bit chemistry, but it's all very easy to follow. Combustion engines work by burning fuel inside a piston chamber. And as you probably know from the old fire triangle, to burn stuff you need fuel, heat, and oxygen. In the case of petrol combustion, the fuel is the petrol, which is hydrogen and carbon, the heat comes from the spark ignition, and the oxygen is mixed into the fuel from the air. And in burning all this fuel with oxygen, everything rearranges and we get a bit of water, some carbon dioxide, maybe some carbon monoxide, and we get a bit of extra energy left over which drives the engine. That's the basics of what's going on chemically. You need the oxygen being fed in with the fuel in order to feed this reaction, otherwise nothing useful will happen. Now there's an ideal ratio for mixing oxygen with petrol, and that's about 14.7 to 1. So every 1 gram of petrol fed into the combustion chamber, you need 14.7-ish grams of oxygen, or thereabouts. That means everything gets burned efficiently with very little left over. So with a normally aspirated engine, that is an engine that breathes all its oxygen from the airflow without any extra help, having less oxygen available in a thinner atmosphere means you have to feed less fuel into the engine, which results in less power output from the engine. So with 26% less oxygen in the atmosphere, engines in Mexico should produce around 26% less power under normal conditions. But we don't have normally aspirated engines anymore, we have turbocharged engines. And what turbos do is spin incredibly fast, normally about eight times faster than the engine itself, to pump air into the engine. And the more air you pump in, the more fuel you can pump in, and the more power you can get out of the engine. At these high altitudes, the teams have to really ramp up the turbo. It now has to do a lot more work to try and get as much oxygen into the engine as it would normally have. So actually, the overall power hasn't dropped too much. But the turbo is having to work about 10 to 15% faster, going from around 100,000 RPM to about 110, 115,000 RPM. And that puts a lot of stress on the turbo, and it adds a lot of heat, which is bad, partly for reliability and partly because the turbos want to pump air as coolly as possible into the engine. Unfortunately, cooling is another thing set back from this cursed low density air. Once on track, F1 cars are only allowed to be cooled by the relative fast-moving airflow. 
and this air is channeled through the ducts and air intakes to all the required places and expelled out of the back of the car. Air cooling works by transferring heat from hot components to each molecule of air as it moves past. That molecule then carries the heat away from the car. If there are fewer molecules available to carry the heat away, then you won't be able to cool the car as well as you'd like. This means overheating engines, turbos, electronics and brakes if you don't prepare the car properly. So you'll see cars that are a lot more opened up. Massive brake ducts, air intakes maximised, more panels open to allow air in and out of the chassis. All of these effects will shift which parts of the car are more important to overall performance. If you've traditionally had an advantage with your internal combustion engine, then that might not mean as much if you don't have a powerful robust turbocharger. Mechanical grip will come heavily into play. The way your suspension and chassis body transfers grip and balance to the car is basically unaffected by air density. So if you're Red Bull and you've got this area of your car nailed, then you'll be rewarded when the power unit's potency becomes less of a differentiating factor. And finally, let's not forget the driver. Fun fact, drivers breathe air. Why do drivers breathe air? The same reason as you and me, to deliver oxygen to the muscles to produce energy. If there's less oxygen available, that means muscles get less oxygen and there's less energy available for exerting yourself through motorsports. The overall effect is having to put in a lot more effort for the same output, which ends up being fairly tiring. Most athletes who will need to compete at altitude will train at altitude for a while ahead of the time. This makes the body produce more blood cells which allow more passage of oxygen to the muscles and brain and basically balances everything out. But with only a week between races there simply isn't the time for proper altitude acclimatisation so the drivers have to, pardon the phrase, suck it up. The next race is Brazil, the second highest race on the calendar where we used to hear a lot of talk about the effects of the thinner air on the engines, but Brazil is only 800 metres above sea level and has only a 10% drop in air density compared to Mexico's 26% deficit. It'll be interesting to see if the unique performances between teams continues after the cars descend 1.4 kilometres to Sao Paulo. But I wouldn't hold your breath.